thank you for to talk about uh, WP WebKit in this conference. Um, I can warn you, I might, I might warn you that um, this is probably higher level than the talks that you've seen before. So excuse me on that. <laughs> I'll try to give you basically an overview of what WebKit and WP is and what it's good at and what it's heading towards. So it's going to be maybe a lot of information, but hopefully it's not too lower level and it's going to be easy to remember. So uh, introductions first, um, like I said, I'm Mario. Um, I'm a computer science engineer. I'm also a partner of Igalia, if you've heard of it. Um, I, I've been involved in open source and working on open source and communities for, for quite a while already, I, since 2000, I don't remember, six or five. Uh, mainly around uh, different communities, but the main ones I think is fair to say is Chromium, WebKit, uh, and Genome. Uh, I've been a long time in there. In WebKit, I, I work mainly on WebKit accessibility for Linux. And then I did other work in the past. I'm not going to do an exhaustive list, but I, I thought those might be interesting on like, work on Linux-based operating systems like Canvas or Little. I was one of those working on MIME as well, <laughs> on the Hidden Application Manager, for those of you who remember. And also work on the Smart TV platform on a brief period of time I was working in the Samsung Research Center in the UK. These days, I spend my time, though, coordinating the WebKit team, so I'm not doing much technical work. I'm still a technical guy, but I'm going to present, what I'm going to present here is not really something I work on, but something that the entire team did. So excuse me if I say something that is not entirely correct, hopefully won't be the case. Um, about Igalia, you probably know Igalia more than me, more, more than to me, sorry. <laughs> uh, we are an open source consultancy. It was founded like 22 years, actually 22 years and two weeks ago. Uh, in Spain. Uh, it started like a consultancy. We wanted to work on open source and started uh, very involved on genome-related technologies. Eventually started looking into web engines through WebKit and after uh, 10 years or so, a bit more than that, it exploded into other areas, like not just web engines, which is a big thing of our business, but also graphics and multimedia, compilers even, and yeah, and, and more recently, graphics and kernel. Um, we are fully remote. Um, we are headquartered in the northwest of Spain in a little city called Coruña, but we work fully remote. And we have this uh, maybe unusual structure where it's entirely flat to the point that uh, the workers own the company and every person joining Igalia is expected to eventually become a fully fledged partner of the company in the legal sense as well. Um, we managed to become top contributors to the web browsers engines. I mentioned this not just for sales speech, but also because it's relevant here for you to understand that we've been working in WebKit for more than 13 years now, in Chromium also for a long time. And so right now we are the, the, the basically the main contributors after Apple and Chromium, after Apple and Google to those two engines. We also have contributors to, to Gecko as well. And in the case of Servo, if you follow the news, uh, we are the company that basically resuscitated <laughs> Servo and took over the, the leadership most recently. So we are basically leading the development there. And then, yeah, besides browsers, uh, we also work on, like I said, compilers, um, graphics, uh, MISA, all kinds of things. And last, we, the kind of work we do, especially on the, on the web world, uh, requires us to be members also of a lot of uh, working groups, so that we are not just working on the implementation of, let's say, web standards and specifications, but also on the, on the actual definition and design of uh, such uh, specifications. But enough about that. Um, so. Um, we are going to talk about web, WP, uh, which is based on WebKit and which is a web browser engine. So these days, these are the main web rendering engines that you can find, uh, WebKit, Chromium, Gecko, and Servo. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus only on WebKit. So sorry for the introduction if for someone of you is already <laughs> very familiar, but I thought it was, it was interesting to, to go through it a little bit. Uh, so what is WebKit? Uh, important clarification, it's an open source uh, web browser engine. It's not a web browser, it's a web browser engine. It was started uh, almost at the same time that Igalia was founded in 2001 as a fork of KHTML and KJS, this, the engines that you have in, in KD for, for Conqueror and, and, well, and, and basically any application rendering web content on KD. Uh, it was actually the basis of uh, Chromium, Google Chrome as well for four or five years. Uh, for a while until um, Chromium decided to fork WebKit into what they call Blink and put it inside of Chromium. So this is 
This is uh, what Chromium has these days. Initially, they started obviously being very similar, but they diverge a lot before, because of one uh, feature of WebKit that sets it apart from other, other things. Like uh, in WebKit, you have, uh, well, it's a project that has several general goals revolving around performance, security, stability, all that, but most importantly, the ability to embed it. Uh, this has been a core goal of WebKit since the start. So the, it's very important for WebKit that that is the product. The product is the library, not whatever you build with that. So it's very important that you, um, you maintain a stable API and ABI all the time because you are expected to, you don't know where you are going to end up using WebKit and, and we want to be that way. When they forked WebKit into Blink and the, the needs were completely different. They just want the web engine for Chromium. The only user of Blink is Chromium. So they don't have any problem breaking the API and ABI because it's an internal thing. So that's a very, very different thing. It also is different than Gecko. Gecko before 2010, I believe, it was also like that. It was um, designed to be embeddable, but after 2010, uh, it became basically something that will be used by Mozilla products, and therefore the API will don't, wouldn't be guaranteed to be stable. So what it became very important on the embedded space for that reason. Uh, it's also available on many different platforms and operating systems. So these days you can use it on desktop and mobile, like uh, Mac, iOS, and Linux but you can also use it on embedded. This flexibility that provides you with this stable API and ABI, like I said, is, is crucial for this. So you can find it on your PlayStation or on your set-top box, or, or maybe you have a, a cooking machine that also uses WebKit. Um, so this very simplistic <laughs> drawing is what I used to explain to people that are not engineers, what is the difference between a browser and a, and a, and a web engine. So um, if you think of a desktop browser very quickly, like the entire thing will be the browser with the back and forward buttons and the address bar and whatnot. And the web engine will be the component that takes care of handling the web content, displaying it in, in that space of, this, of the window, and also that allows you to interact with it. So it doesn't have to be a square. It doesn't even have to be rendering anything visible. But if you think of a browser on a desktop, um, I guess the analogy will be like that. What it is, whatever it takes care of that part and the browser is everything else. So, uh, like I said, I'm not going to enter into a lot of detail, um, but I think WebKit Architecture 101 was on, in order. So I, I don't think you can simplify WebKit much more than this. Uh, maybe you can pick different colors, but uh, you cannot simplify more than this. So basically, um, you have like three levels in WebKit, let's say. You have the, the top level will be the, the API layer, the WebKit API, which is what you use to expose um, it, which is what you use from the application, what the application link, uh, link against, and what gives you all the goodness of the, of the web platform. It also brings you, hides from you, uh, many good things like the multiple process model of WebKit, so that if a part, let's say, some JavaScript crashes, or a tab crashes, or, or your net, network activity goes south for whatever reason, it doesn't bring down the entire browser. So all that, you get it for free just by using the WebKit API. The, it's the only thing you need to see from your application. And that's obviously platform specific. Even the language is different. In, in Linux, in WebKit GTK, that's, that's written in C uh, with a genome-like uh, API. Uh, in Mac, is Objective-C. And in iOS, I, I, I honestly don't remember, but it's probably something else. Then you have, um, you have WebCore. WebCore is this big chunk in the middle that is platform agnostic. You, what you have there is generic implementations and abstractions for uh, many things that you need to do, like you, the parsing of the HTML and the CSS, uh, figuring out which visual components you are going to put in display, how you are going to, to place things, in which order, uh, if you are going to put things in layers, all those kind of things. Uh, if you, because my path of accessibility, your interpretation, how you interpret the, the information from the website that needs to be um, put into an accessibility tree, all those kind of things that are not platform specific and needed for any port goes in WebCore. And then you have the platform part, which is obviously the platform-specific hooks, the low-level plumbing. So if you are in, in GTK, in Linux, uh, obviously you don't fetch the stuff from the network using the same methods that you use on Mac or on PlayStation, and same goes for graphics or multimedia. So that's platform-specific. And finally, you have JavaScript core, which is the JavaScript engine. And yeah, that one is also platform agnostic. It, it relates a lot with web core, because when you when you implement JavaScript APIs, the, the two of them have to work together. But the nice thing about this is that you have two platform-specific components and two platform-agnostic ones. And the platform-agnostic ones are fairly big. And when, you, when, a port, when, a, when a flavor of WebKit 
benefits of a change or a fix on something or a security fix, all the flavors of work get benefit of that, unless it's a problem on the platform specific code, of course. And this takes us to the um, definition of a WebKit port. It's an inter important concept for this talk. Uh, so the, again, this is my own definition. I haven't looked it up, but to me, it is what it is. It's an adaptation of WebKit for a specific platform. So these days, you have many different WebKit ports. Uh, some of them live out of tree. Some of them live in tree in the upstream repository. So I'm just talking about the upstream ones. So right now, we have uh, seven, actually six. You have the, the Mac one. Uh, I'm not going to read the slide, but you have the one for Mac, another one for iOS. You have two for Windows. One is deprecated, actually. Uh, it's still used on, on iCloud for Windows. I actually didn't know that iCloud worked on Windows. I had to look it up. Uh, and then the official Windows one is WinCairo, which is mostly used for very specific things like the, the, the PlayStation SDK that the PlayStation developers used to, to debug the actual PlayStation port, which is what runs on the PlayStation. And then you have these last two ones, WebKit GTK and um, WP, which I, I, went, I, I gave them a, a, their own slide for, for a very simple reason. They are basically siblings. Uh, they both target the Linux-based Linux -based systems. And the reason why they are siblings is because basically WebKit GTK was first, and WP started, kind of started, like, uh, what if we take GTK out of WebKit GTK and reduce all the dependencies to the minimum possible? to make it more flexible, and that's how WP was born. Um, but still, there, is, there are a lot of things that are common. It's the same good Linux, same good um, GStreamer, same good many things. So many common parts are still there for both, like glib, libsup, or GStreamer. Sorry for the repetition. Um, there are key differences, though, mainly around graphics and input. And this is when we are getting into the embedded things. Like on embedded graphics and input, it's not granted that you're going to have a keyboard or a display even. So that's the main difference. But that goes along with the different use cases that they are designed for. So WebKit GTK these days, I think it's fair to say, is the go-to solution for having web content, handling web content on your on GTK-based application. So no wonder it's, it's using many GNOME components. It's also supporting, fully supporting GTK3, even with, with all the features that you may expect. And in supporting GTK for now, as I have to be fair, uh, it's still lacking accessibility support in there, but we are working on that. Um, WP, however, uh, I, I have an entire section about it, obviously, uh, is just much lower level. It's the same at embedded devices, so an entirely different thing. And for graphics and input, it doesn't provide you with anything. So and, and this is actually not a bug, it's a, it's a feature. Um, to finish this general section, um, I took the previous diagram, the generic one. So with the example of WebKit GTK, I think you can see very clearly the, the, how, a work is the, how a port is designed and how it's supposed to work and why it's, it's, it works really well for, for WebKit. So basically, like I, what I said before, you have the same structure depending, uh, regardless of the port that you are using. And if you are in, in, in a GTK application, you use WebKit GTK that provides you just with the WebKit GTK layer. And, and then Lipsu for networking, Cairo for 2D rendering, GStreamer for multimedia, uh, or ATK or ATSPI for accessibility. But if you are a Mac, you use other things. There's an Objective-C API. Uh, I'm not very expert on Mac, but stuff, Mac stuff. Um, OK, so yeah, almost on time. So um, the question now is, I'm going to try to go like going a little bit down. Um, so, and what is WP then? So, I already anticipated this support. So, it's support optimized for embedded devices. Uh, that's, I would say, is the, probably the Linux-based embedded devices, probably the best definition. Uh, so, as such, uh, because it's based on WebKit, and WebKit is the same thing that is used on, on modern web browsers like Safari, on iOS, or, or actually any, on iOS, any browser is using WebKit underneath these days. Um, because of that, it's, it's a modern and comprehensive implementation of the web platform. You, you even get a fully operational JavaScript engine these days, which is a very complex piece of software as well. So you get that. Uh, I, I have to say, on 64-bit, the JavaScript engine, JavaScript core, is, is fully supported on, on WP. And these days, we also have an internal effort to maintain the 32-bit architectures for, for ARM. So if you, have on, you are on ARM 7, uh, you, you are supported. You don't have, I mean, just a note, I mean, you are supported, but 
JavaScript engines have different levels, different tiers of optimization. So in the case of 32-bit for ARM, you only get the two first tiers of optimization, the, the baseline JIT, JIT and the DFG, I think it's called. Yeah, the DFG JIT. You don't get the other ones, but I mean, at least it's support. Um, then um, the other thing is like, because it's meant to be embedded, uh, the, 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 the whole point of removing GTK is not to make things more com com complex just for fun, but to make it more flexible. So the focus is that, flexibility, flexibility, but also security and performance. You want it to perform well with low resources, and you want it to be secure. You want to make sure that if there is this vulnerability that came out uh, last month and that uh, Safari is already patched against, you also get those patches. So it's, it's an important aspect as well. The other thing is that um, we want to maintain dependencies down to a minimum. Again, same thing, constraint devices, uh, flexibility. And we came up with this backend based architecture where you, where you don't do, on, not even at the platform level of, of the port, you, do the, you handle the input or the output. You, instead, you delegate that into what we call external backends. That gives you more flexibility on how you, let's say, for instance, display things on, on a screen. I, I, I want to clarify, you might not have a screen, but you want, might want to do that, or how you uh, handle input. Um, and then, yeah, other thing is low memory and footprint. I don't think I have to convince you why that's important. You might be running this on a, on a device with one gig of RAM or even less. And finally, um, and this is, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, we got feedback from customers saying uh, that we explicitly asked, what do you like most about WP? And with no, almost no exception, everyone highlights the great support for, for hardware accelerated uh, graphics and multimedia support. I guess it's no wonder because WP, one of the main use cases are set of boxes. And on those, you need to have hardware acceleration for, let's say, fancy effects on the, on the interface. And also, you want to support multimedia really well, like 4K video, uh, 60 FPS, and you HDR, uh, I don't know, uh, DRM, like these different extensions you have to be able to watch some uh, online services. So that is WP. So let me insist one again. What is not WP? It's not a general purpose browser. So if you want to use WP for um, using web applications, using any specification, any web platform API under the sun, it might not be for you. It, it covers a lot of them, but not all of them. It just, what it does is provides you with the building blocks that you can, you can incorporate the web into your embedded device. In, in any, almost any way you want. And if something is missing, you, you can extend it through backend. But it doesn't implement all the APIs. So uh, I was talking to someone before this talk, like a good example is an API called the pointer lock API, which is the API that you need to implement to be able to play uh, first person shooters on the web. It basically locks you the mouse so that you don't see the pointer going around, instead you, you change the view. So uh, I guess it's not hard to imagine why it does not uh, extremely important re requirement for embedded devices. At least it hasn't been so far. And because of that, it hasn't been pri prioritized. So it's not implemented. It's, it's an example. Actually, I, I cannot think of many more examples, so I'm mostly always using that one. But it gives you an idea that uh, basically implements the APIs that make sense for this, for this world. And the other important thing is it doesn't rely on, on any toolkit. WebKit GTK relies on, on the GTK toolkit, and it provides you with a GTK widget, which is what we call the web view. Uh, you don't have that here. Basically, anything uh, depends on the backends for, for output and input. And this uh, adds extra complexity, yes, but also opens the door to um, very interesting and uh, also not, not conventional use cases like uh, server-side rendering or satellite mode. And I'll, I'll try to I'll, I'll comment a bit more. I'll give a couple of examples in a moment about that. So now you are in the web, you're looking for WebKit, GTK, and WP, and what, what is this? And then you, first source of confusion is that you find two repos, and both of them are public. One is, the one, both in GitHub, to make it even more confusing. So there is, there is the upstream WP, and this, this is basically the, the port, the WebKit port that lives upstream in WebKit, in exactly the same repository of the, the Mac, the, the PlayStation, or the WebKit GTK ports. They are all upstream. If a, if a port benefits of a, a, a general improvement, WP gets that. Uh, and, but it is, doesn't assume any particular configuration, any, any customization, it's device agnostic, so it's great. And then you can find this other one called Web Platform for Embedded, and it's a downstream version of WP. So why this one exists? Because this one 
is optimized for specific devices, in particular, a specific uh, kind of set-top boxes, mostly Broadcom and other type of devices. But basically, some customers are using, or not some customer, customers or not customer. Many companies are are um, developing set-top boxes using the so-called RDK, the Reference Design Kit, and and that's basically gives that's something that gives you a, something called the WP framework, which is a tool that you can embed to create your set-top box application. So. You have more information there, but the, in a nutshell, RDK is this, this framework that allows you to build set-top boxes without having to reuse the wheel, and for a very specific uh, for use case, a set-top boxes. So this downstream version of WP contains a lot of optimizations for that, and it lives there. Um, just to finish this more generic part, uh, a, a, couple of, a few examples of products that we know are, are, are up there. Uh, we don't know anything, everything, because <laughs> so I guess it's impossible, but again, set the boxes main use case. Uh, last word we got on that is that just with a single customer, they told us their metrics were pointing to more than 100 million devices, so, and just, one, just one, one customer telling us that, so we really don't know. Smart home appliances, uh, we work with a, very, uh, with a, with a customer that in, has this very popular kitchen machine that I won't name here, but it has this screen where you can see your recipes and interact with the interface, and that's using WP as well. So you have it there. Audio systems with no screen, and you might be wondering why you want that. So maybe you want to use a web, a web browser engine, a web engine, sorry, to fetch some multimedia content, like songs or music or a playlist, and you want to play them through speakers. And it's coming through a web, so you need something to consume that web content. So some people are using it for that. Digital cines as well, these big screens or kiosk modes as well. GPS devices, uh, audio conference, Held server-side rendering. This is an interesting one. So many people are using WP not to uh, display a website anywhere, but instead they they maybe have this source of video um, input, and they they want to overlay something on top of that, and that something is created with web technologies. So they want they want WP to in, interpret that web content, put it into a let's say EGL surface or whatever, and then send that to GStreamer pipeline and merge everything together to create the overlay. So people are, and that's happening on, on a server. <laughs> so it's, it's very creative. Uh, QI and testing as well, like Microsoft Playwright, you can look it up. It's, it's using uh, WP for testing and WebKit uh, on applications. Um, yeah, so let me grab some water. <laughs> Again, back to the diagrams, um, the architecture of WP is very similar to the one of, of WebKit GTK, but basically because both are ports. So I won't enter into much detail. In, this is actually overly simplified. So in this case, you, you have something similar. You have the application, which is whatever you have that you want to, to use web content from, and, and that you have that interacting directly with the, with the API that is offered by the, by the WP port, which is that WebKit component in the, in the diagram. Um, and then, which is, this is the main difference with WebKitDK, you have the backends. And the backends are these platform-specific things that deal with graphics uh, output or input on your particular device. And yes, there is, I realize there is another thing called COG there that I will enter into more detail now. Not much more detail, but just to give you an idea. So you go to the WP website and you will realize there is no one single thing, there are four. <laughs> so what are all those four components? So there are these ones. So the first component is what we call uh, WP WebKit. This is the, the actual WebKit port. It's like WebKit GTK, but uh, for WP. Um, this one implements everything you need for Linux-based platforms, plus all the abstraction layers that you need for handling uh, graphics and input. And it defers the display of web content and the handling of input to the backends. Again, it doesn't do, uh, in, in WebKit GTK, that will be done inside the port, in the platform level of, of the port, but in here is not. It, it, that's actually implemented in the backends. Then you have LeadWP, which is this library that provides the glue between the port, the WP port, and the, and the backends. It basically provides you with abstractions um, for rendering related callbacks that you, you call from the WP port and that are implemented in the actual backend. And it also allows you to, allows the, the input backends to communicate directly uh, with, the, with, the, with the WP port. Uh, responding to input events, like clicking here, clicking there, typing, whatever. And then the other component you can download for the website is the WP Backend FDO. 
which this is just a backend that is the reference backend that we offer, offer already that is um, based on free desktop technologies. Namely, the main thing is that it's, it's based on Wayland. So if you are, if you want, you have an embedded device and you have a Wayland uh, a display server and, and that's good for you, you can just go with this and just, you just have input and output to a Wayland display. You can put it, you can put the web content full screen, wherever you can, you, you can do it. Uh, if, if that's not your case, you can replace that backend for, with another backend for your specific needs, or you can just take that one and modify it as, as, as you want. And it supports different architectures, NXP, Broadcom, and then, of course, regular PC. And then we have COG. What, <laughs> what is COG? It's this weird thing that we also offer. It's, a, it's not really an application. It's a launcher that what it does, if, if you are in a Wayland environment, what it does is just fires up a, a borderless window where you just see the, the content, the web content that you ask it to load through the command line, uh, loaded, and allows you to also to react to input events. Uh, this, this is very convenient. For some cases, it's more than enough, so many customers are using this directly. And because you don't have any buttons or any back forward address bar or whatever, and you still need a way to interact. So you, when you install COG, you also get this command line utility, COG CTL, that is basically uh, provides you with a convenient way of using the DBAS interface to ask it to go back, forward, load this, load that, go full screen, whatever. And also this COG CTL if you also allows you to select the backend that you want to use. So if you don't want to use the FTO backend, you can pick a different one. Okay, uh, it's a lot of stuff, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I will publish the slides uh, later on, so if you have, I mean, if you have any questions, I can, I'm happy to answer. So I could talk forever about many different things, JavaScript, uh, multimedia, network, whatever, but I pick these two items because I think in particular for WP is, is like the, the cornerstone of, the, of, of what it can do and, and does it really good. So graphics and multimedia. Uh, so in this slide, I want to highlight like, the fact that we, it's very important for us to provide hardware acceleration for graphics. And in order to do that, um, well, we do a lot of things, but I, I guess the three main things that came to mind when I was preparing this talk were these three. So the first of all is that since a couple of releases ago, it supports Angle, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with Angle. Um, three, good. <laughs> so <laughs> Angle is a nice acronym for an even nicer meaning. Uh, but the, the summary is that this is a library that what it provides you is with, um, allows you to don't have to worry about platform-specific details for, for implementing or for running WebGL applications. Instead, basically just, just work with open, the OpenGL ES specification and internally Angle translate that into whatever specific library underneath you have, OpenGL or Vulkan or DirectX, so you, Direct3D. So, yeah. So it's very convenient. And this, another side effect, because it's what is used to generate OpenGL or whatever Vulkan or whatever code for WebGL, is that automatically, just by using this, it made us more conformant with the, with the test suites for WebGL. And the other important thing is that it paves the way for WebGL2. Yes, I'm not an expert on that, but all I know is that WebGL2 requires this to work. Um, the other thing that is highlightable, I think, is that since the 238 release, uh, we support the MABuff which is this nice feature on recent kernels, kernel five something, I think, wrong, that allows you for very efficient buffer sharing with zero copy, just providing, moving a file descriptor around, you, you can be extremely efficient and not having to copy things over and over, all over the place. Uh, the problem is that not all devices have the combination of hardware and software that allows you to use DMA buff. So in, the, in this release that is, just came out uh, a few days ago, we also added a fallback implementation in case you don't have DMA buff available for use on your device and in case, or, or you don't have GBM or whatever. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, now it's working on any device. The problem, obviously, if you don't have DMA buff, it's not going to be fast, but it's, going, it's like the JavaScript in 32-bit, it's going to work. Uh, and the third thing, very important, and this is actually not WP specific, is the new SVG engine that we've been working on for the past four years or so. This is very important because it enables something that was not possible for, for, what, 10 years or 15 years, I don't remember, which is to have hardware acceleration for SVG interfaces. And the reason why it was not possible is because while we have been having for a while, for a long time already, hardware acceleration for things like CSS transformations, uh, but not on SVGs because the pipelines were separate. 
So anything yeah, that you will do with CSS over an HTML and will go to the GPU, won't go to the GPU on, on SVG. So this work, what it does is unifies those pipelines. So both things go through the same way. And now automatically, just with four years of effort, <laughs> uh, you get uh, hardware acceleration for SVG, and that's great. And then, well, this is more work in progress thing. We are also working on the supporting the GPU process, for which DMA buff and angle is also a requirement. So you, you, I guess now it's understandable why I thought this, this was important to mention. And the other side of the coin, multimedia. Um, again, not an expert here. My, my work was accessibility, but... So WP uses GStreamer for multimedia. That's, that's the main thing. And as such, it provides you already with backends that implement different use cases. So, and for instance, uh, we are now working on WebRTC. It's work in progress, and it does down through a WebRT GST WebRTC backend, something like that, I think it's called. Um, we, not, we are not limited to implementing backends for WebKit, but sometimes in order to make them work, you have to also work upstream on GStreamer, on the core of GStreamer and the plugins, and that's what we do in order to enable these key features that are very important for the industry, like you know, all these media something APIs, web audio, or media source extensions, encrypted media extensions. If you want to watch movies from providers, you need those. And if you are a set-top boss company, <laughs> you definitely need those. The other thing is that we also want to use hardware acceleration for multimedia, not just graphics, so to improve performance. So in this particular case, we are also using DMA buff, but for moving buffers around uh, decoders and different plugins. And this, this basically allows us to be more efficient in the GStreamer pipelines, and, and also we can adapt and develop uh, things more tailored to specific hardware. And last. Again, another work in progress kind of thing. We've, working, we've been working on web codes. It's a lot of work done there. The main thing is already there, and web artists, like I mentioned before. But um, that's more, that's more um, work in progress than on the other things. So, um, demos time. Uh, there's time for everything, I guess. Um, let me take some breath. So, this first one. What it's showing you is a WebGL application. It's, it's basically WP running a WebGL application on a Raspberry Pi 3 over there. It's providing quite a decent, if you check the CPU usage, it's quite low. I mean, maybe you think 30% is not too low, but this is a Raspberry Pi 3. And the, the, the FPA SPS rate is, is, fairly, is fairly decent. I mean, again, it's, it's a really slow machine. And we are getting 20 FPS on these complex things or, or more with the CPU low. If you don't have hardware acceleration, this is a no-go. And the second part of this video is, uh, is WP, again, on a Raspberry Pi 3, showing uh, HD video uh, at 60 FPS. <laughs> you have to take my word for that. <laughs> the video is not great, but... And applying different transformations as well to it through GStreamer pipelines. And these transformations are also hardware accelerated. So these demos, you, maybe if you went to, um, to the Embedded Open Source Summit, maybe you saw it already, because they are still, they are quite old, I would say. Uh, but I pick them because I think it still show very well the point of running complex things on a web browser on a really uh, constrained device. Although I get that this being the embedded recipes, this, embed this uh, small device might be quite big for things that you might be used to, but still. Um, and this other demo is uh, the new SVG engine working on a desktop machine. Uh, it's giving 60 frames per second. Again, take my word for it that it was not like that before. And the reason it's doing that is because this time it's putting every single moving part on a layer, and those layers get sent to the GPU, who does the compositing. So before this, this was like very chunky. Uh, and this is the same thing on the same kind of thing on a Raspberry Pi 3 again. And this demo is, I think, is two years old. Um, what you're seeing here is an SVG uh, source moving around, stretching, and this thing is basically we put different paths of the tiger into different layers and, and move them, push them away, and to see how it performs. So it's, it's giving consistent 60 FPS. Uh, and the reason is, again, because it's using the same pipeline that HTML and CSS will use for CSS 3D transformation, so it's quite cool. And it's, it's really advanced right now, this, this engine. It's in the process of upstreaming, we upstream most of it, um, and we are working on, on pushing it through the finish line. So um, I'm almost finishing. Um, I, I promise I will talk also about where we are going. And so we have a lot of plans for WP, but again, I want to summarize 
the most important ones, I would say. Uh, this is actual work that we are doing. It's not really plans. It's, we are working actively on this. So the first thing important is that we want to release a new uh, and simplified design of the, of, the, of the WP WebKit port. Uh, what we have right now, this combination of WP WebKit component and this leave WP thing that glues with the backend, is one of those things that you could describe as it was a good idea at the time, but maybe it's no longer that good idea. So one thing we want to do is to put those into a single library so that it's easier to handle. Uh, in, coincidentally, we also want to simplify internal layers. We, we, we used uh, very, well, very now, but kind of exotic things to, to handle IPC on WP and using a nested Wayland server. We don't need that anymore, so that's another thing that we are doing. Those are two examples. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of changes happening at the API layer. layer. Uh, still, we strive for, for maintaining API and, and ABI compatibility, so we are going to, to provide some sort of uh, intermediate step or something that you can still use uh, the new WP with the old API if you want, but yeah. Uh, the second thing is the graphics pipeline. This, I mean, it's already good, yes, but it can be much better. Because right now, uh, we are just, it's just a year since we started using DMA buff and we've seen great improvements. The problem is that not everything can use DMA buff. And in the set-top box business, there are many set-top boxes that cannot use it because of an old kernel or old hardware or whatever. So right now we have the fallback. It's better than nothing, but it's not great in terms of performance. So the other thing we want to do is to make sure that we, we can have efficient buffer sharing in as many devices as possible. Unfortunately, it's going to be a kind of case-by-case -case situation, but we have to do that. The second is very important as well. It's been in the works and under investigation in, in Italia for a while. It's, uh, we want to have hardware accelerated 2D rendering. And this is something that if you're familiar with Cairo, you, you might know where it's coming from. Um, WebKit DTK and WP use Cairo for 2D rendering, which is not hardware accelerated, and that's a problem. And also Cairo is unmaintained, so that's not great either. And back in the day, there was this thing called Cairo GL, but that has been discontinued, so <laughs> not looking any promising. Uh, so we are now doing some experiments with uh, internal things uh, that, I mean, I don't want to talk that much about that, but uh, we are working on this. We are, this year we did a big push and we are starting to see promising results that will allow us to improve the performance a lot in here. So that's going to be, that's going to be I think, a, a big breakthrough if once we get it ready. Because you, suddenly you are going to be able to hardware accelerate things like font rendering, and that's crazy. Uh, and then other thing, multiple buffer support, what this means is that uh, everybody knows about double and triple buffering, but what if you want to have more buffers? You might wonder why is that a good idea? Well, the truth is that we've seen with some customer that it's actually, it's actually offering uh, performance improvement in, in some particular cases. So we want to do that as well. Well, we want not, we are already doing. These three things I just mentioned, we are already working on that. And then things we are going to work as well, but we haven't done much so far is uh, the GPU process, which means putting all the GPU work into a separate uh, process, uh, and also WebGPU, which is this uh, web platform API. That I'm not entirely sure what it's exactly about, but you can Google if you are curious. Um, and then the, on the multimedia side, we want to improve it, maintain it as usual, but more specifically, uh, we have specific plans about improving, continuing the work on web codex, and also to finish the GStreamer based implementation of WebRTC. The second thing is the tooling. We, we, I mean, in the history of WebKit and WebKit GTK in particular, we use many different things for developers and, and QA. Like, if you are familiar with JH Build, that's how, when I was working WebKit, how we work on WebKit, uh, which was convenient for some things, but it was not great for others. Also, reproduce, reproducibility was not its forte, really. Uh, so we are currently, we moved into using something more like um, container-like thing, but not quite container-like platform for, for QA and, and providing also like a snapshot of an application so you could try WebKit GTK uh, more regularly. But we've been doing a big revamp on this and we basically went all the way and we implemented a new SDK that is container-based. It's based on OCI images handled by Podman and we are already using it internally, it's working great, not just for working on WebKit, but also uh, to work on dependencies where you need to patch things like GStreamer or GStreamer plugins. And we are currently testing this internally. Our multimedia team was, uh, is, is now testing this particular use case of working in GStreamer. QA, we want to improve that as well, um, because, yeah, I mean, it's working for a while, but um, we can do, we think we have room for improvement in the, 
in the continuous integration system. And we also think that once the SDK is stable enough, we can, we can likely use it as well on QA, on the QA bots. And that would be great too. And then documentation, which is this big pending thing that uh, is not being great. In all fairness, it's not great for the WebKit project as a whole, but we, we want to make it better, make it more uh, accessible. So once we get the new API and, and all those things in place, uh, we hope that we'll be in a much better position. With, with the new API and the new SDK and all that, we improve the documentation. Hope that these things combined will be very good. And not just for WP, actually, all these things apply to, to WebKit GTK and WP, which um, we also want to align as much as possible so that you don't have to have too many specific things. And the last thing I want to mention is, I mentioned at the beginning very shyly, I think, or maybe I didn't and I forgot, uh, we are experimenting as well with running WP on Android. This is uh, it's something that started like an experiment in 2017. We stopped it and then we resumed it last year. Uh, first, because it's, it's something that it looked like a good idea, no? So if you, if you want to provide a WebKit-based alternative to the Chromium-based WebView on Android, uh, these days you, you cannot run WebKit on Android. And so it, it sounded like a good thing for, for many different reasons. Maybe you're in a country where Google technology is banned, or maybe you don't want to use Google technology, or, or maybe you want to be able to compare how uh, Chromium and WebKit performs in an Android device. So there are several reasons. But also we learned that uh, some companies are, even in the set of business, they are also using Android. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities here. So right now what we have already is an experiment. We already supports all these architectures. The, the Intel ones, right now we are using them mostly because of the emulator. Uh, it already integrates with Android main loop and the process management stuff. It already does accelerated hardware accelerated media decoding and, and WebGL. And what we are working right now is on, 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 on a bunch of more things like implementing more APIs of the web view, uh, implementing the support for the remote web inspector, which if you're not familiar with it, it's very important to be able to debug uh, Android devices, implementing web driver support that will be important for, for QA as, as well. And the, the good news is that this is not going, I mean, we did a, a port before, actually two of them, WebGTK and WP, so we know what it takes. Fortunately, this shouldn't require that. So uh, this WP Android thing, how it works is like on top of the WP API. And yeah, I prepared this video as well. This is actually from last year, WebKit Contributors Meeting in October 2022. This is how it looked back then, a year ago. Uh, this is just browsing a, a random website um, completely random, and this also, well, I mean, the, my colleague also added this, this option for cookies just to prove that, you know, it's, fast, it's easy to integrate with things that uh, WebKit already handles, like cookies or in, intelligent tracking systems. It allows you to interact with the input methods just as normal. You can bring up the on-screen keyboard and type anything, load a website. Uh, this website is proof that we are using WebKit, <laughs> in case you don't believe me. Um, and the last thing of the video is, I mentioned that it has hardware accelerated multimedia decoding and, and WebGL. So this is loading the WebGL acquiring example from before. And that's, it's, it's very quick, but you'll see that the FPS is around 100. So it's with 500, with 500 fishes. So well, it's still pretty, pretty good. And this is from last year. Now we are working on, the, on updating this prototype to WP242 and it brings a lot of improvements among those like this buffer sharing thing as well. We don't have DMA buff on Android, but there is something called a hardware buffer that probably fulfills the same role. So um, we are hoping there's going to be a big improvement. And that's, that's everything from my side. Like I prepared this one just for you to remember all the stuff that I just dumped onto you. Uh, so the main idea is WP is support of WebKit for embedded devices. It's modular, it should be flexible enough to, and, and require not many resources so that you can adapt it to many types of use cases. Hardware acceleration is big for graphics and multimedia. You also have these two flavors, depending on, if you are on a nerd RDK-based environment, you might want to use the downstream one, but otherwise you probably want to use the upstream one. It's deployed on millions of devices, as far as we were told. Um, and we are now, uh, Actively, this year, we were doing explicitly a big revamp, a big push, of, big push of, the, of many improvements that we want to do around these key areas like graphics, multimedia, tooling, QA, and, and something else that I don't remember now. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and the last thing is that we are experimenting with WP Android. So I hope I covered 
everything, and I didn't cover too much. Um, questions? Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that on the graphics acceleration side, you are accelerating things like uh, composition, transformation, um, but the actual drawing is done by Cairo, so it's still like on CPU. So, so uh, the actual drawing for 2D rendering, yeah. for 2D rendering in right now is, is, doing on, is being done on Cairo, yes. All right. And that's yeah. a problem. Yeah, yeah. So following up on that, uh, I know that a number of systems on a chip have those uh, vector drawing accelerators, which uh, suffer from lack of API and general lack of interest. Um, is that something that you have like looked at? Is there interest in that? Do you know if performance-wise it kind of makes sense to use them or not? You mean uh, the question is about whether we are considering using platform-specific 2D rendering APIs on certain mm -hmm. platforms? Mm -hmm. Well, more like accelerators. So it's like pieces of hardware that can do vector drawing. So like you tell them, draw a circle, draw a, a box, whatever. Um, th there is some s systems on a chip that have that. And I have never seen like anything use that. So it feels like it could be a good fit for accelerating uh, drawing on embedded. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, again, there is no unified API like OpenGL or Vulkan or anything like that. So generally, people tend to just ignore them. Uh, but do you think that, that would be something to leverage? And would there be interest in maybe having a common API or something like that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that familiar with that part, but I, I can actually pass the question. I think it's an interesting one. What we are trying to do is to come up with, uh, we've been investigating the option of maybe writing our own library that optimizes very specific use cases. So, and, and I mean, it's very hard to do a drop-in replacement of Cairo with something else and expect it to work without breaking the entire web. That's very difficult. But what is, is feasible or should be feasible is that you analyze, there are certain types of operations that you might, you, you might be able to optimize and send to the GPU like a Bezier curve or whatever, or this particular operation that repeats all over the place. And if you manage to, uh, to use your hardware accelerated solution for those operations while still re retaining Cairo as a fallback for the others, maybe it's not as good as a drop in the replacement, but allows you to iteratively you know, uh, improve things. But yeah, hardware accelerated is something I was not aware of, and I'll, I'll ask that. Thank you. Yeah, and also, you could uh, plug that into Cairo so you keep using the same API and you'd have less chance of breaking stuff. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the relationship between uh, WebKit and uh, QWeb Engine provided by Qt uh, Framework. Sorry, say again. Can you speak a bit louder? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the framework Qt is, using, is providing, in fact, a QWeb Engine. What is the relationship between this part and WebKit? So the question is about the Q, Qt Framework, Qt WebKit? Qt WebKit? I'm not entirely sure I got the, the question right. The Qt framework, you know? So Qt, I mean, if I remember correctly, I'm more of a GNOME guy, so, but if I remember correctly in Qt, you had these two solutions. One is the Qt WebKit that use WebKit, and then they're moving to this thing, Qt Web Engine, that is yeah. based on Chromium, as far as I understand these days. Yeah, okay. So I'm not sure if, not sure. I, don't, I don't think I answered your question, but the, the Qt WebKit thing, um, we, one of my colleagues, Philip Norman, is the one that is, came up with that thing, and we know some people are using it, and it's working reasonably well in some cases where you just need you know, a web view to, like for instance, I heard recently there is this, this customer that they are using it just because they have this cute base application, and at some point they need to show a login screen to the user for some authentication, and they use that cute web kit, and it works fine. And they don't want to pull the entire Chromium just because of that. So in those cases, work well. But I, I'm not an expert. If you want to, if you want to know more about Qt WebKit in particular, I can pass you the contact of my colleague Philip Norman, who is the person that knows everything about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a small question. We often use uh, system frameworks for building like uh, Yocto or BuildRoot uh, in embedded systems. Mm -hmm. Are you integrated? Is WPE integrated with BuildRoot or Yocto? Yes, yes, it, it, we are doing that. We, if you go to the WebKit, WPWebKit.org website, and there is a big blue button at the top that says Get WP. And one of the ways that we tell people you can get WP and try it is precisely by getting the, the Yocto recipe for, it's called MetaWebKit. 
So what that gives you is just the baseline for, for building uh, WP on top. And there are other layers as well, including more things. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, build root as well. Yes, I was talking about Yocto, yes. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, you mentioned GStreamer and WebRTC. So I was curious about your WebRTC plans. Are you planning to use GStreamer's WebRTC bin implementation or link to LibWebRTC? Say again, sorry? For web, the WebRTC plans that are coming up, are you planning to use GStreamer's WebRTC bin implementation or are you planning to use LibWebRTC and link? No, no, the, the plan, and, and Philip again, he's very adamant on that, uh, is the GStreamer WebRTC plugin. And, thanks. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, f sorry, for like the overlay stuff, right, with the different color formats on these embedded devices, like, did you find a workaround or that? I know there was like talk about live lift off and stuff. What do you mean? The uh, like the overlays. Ah, uh, what I was talking before about this server side rendering, is that? Yeah, yeah. So you said there were optimizations on the graphics side. So like all these embedded hardwares, they have like, like a few overlays, but they're all different pixel formats. Yeah. Like, are you able to utilize those or do you have to like have the same pixel format as the um the main layer that you're working on i'm not sure if i mean i think if the question is whether we can adapt to different pixel formats on different devices uh, uh no 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 not pixel formats on different devices the same device but different pixel formats on different layers uh i i mean from my point of view i'm i think we can do that because i'm i'm now seeing a project i'm following a project where they actually have those kind of needs I think, but I'm not entirely sure because that the, the needs there are more mostly related to the, the direct scan out capabilities of the certain devices and adapting that to different types of pixel formats. But um, the thing is, uh, all that stuff lives in the in the in this backend thing. So if you if the FDO backend doesn't do what you want, you can always do that. You have that flexibility from the point of backend. So you don't need to touch WebKit for for those things. And yeah, and you can you can do fairly fairly big adaptations. Yeah, just to follow up on that last question, I think um, that maybe you meant the display engine uh, layers. What was it? Uh, did you mean the display engine layers yeah. uh, for like hardware-based composition at the display level at the last scan out thing? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's supported, unfortunately. And yeah, it's pretty new that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that might. Yeah, but um, as far as I know, um, we had a, a project on on Cog some some time ago, and I, I remember looking at that code, and it was just like one primary plane um, in DRM, so. Uh, unfortunately, I, yeah, I don't think that that can be leveraged. Okay, thank you, Mario. It was a great talk.